Welcome to the Affiliate BI Podcast. Today, we're chatting with Karai Tugberg Gubur, who is the founder of Holistic SEO and Digital and is a creator of the Topical Authority course. Uh, Karai, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, I want to get started, which is, what is your story and how did you end up in SEO? So many people actually know this story, uh, but I believe many also don't know it. It's an interesting coincidence, to be honest. I was at the last grade in my university and I was in the gym. And one of my friends told me that actually there is something called SEO. Then I told that actually it's a kind of drug name because the name O means like, like oxygen. And I thought S means sulfur or something like that. And I, I told that actually my friend started to be a drug dealer and he was cooking all these things because in university you get these type of friends. They just cook stuff. They sell these things in the forest, etc. And I had a few friends like that. And I thought this was a new drug. So I was asking, like, what is it like and how did you get in that? And he explained to me that actually it is not about drugs. It's about digital marketing and it is like solving a puzzle. You just actually, let's say, analyzes uh, the search engine result pages. He told me then you try to understand why the top one is at the top and the bottom one is at the bottom. Then you solve the puzzle. It sounds interesting to me. Then I found a few people in the whitehead industry and a few other people in the blackhead industry. They found me. And then I had two opposite uh, different stories in both sides. In fact, uh, the people I met in the Black Hat one, some of them actually managed to get like 12,000 years of in prison penalty. <laughs> some others became hugely rich and they went to the Georgia or Kazakhstan and they constructed malls. And I stayed at the SU. I am actually the only person uh, from that circle stayed in the SU, I can tell. Ah, that's uh, quite the story. It's uh, I guess it goes without saying, if you're going to have an addiction, make it SEO. <laughs> yeah, if you don't like it, it's very hard discipline uh, area to work in because what you know yesterday will be invalid tomorrow and you will need to relearn it again. You will need to solve it again, again, again. Then you will be getting more fundamental principles, or let's say principle-like patterns and then you will need to conceptualize them and the hard part is seo is a social skill which means it doesn't matter whether you are a good seo or not your team also needs to get you believe in you and you will need to be motivating them so there is not not that much single person success in the seo and usually if a project goes bad most of the time it goes bad not because of lack of the seo knowledge but because of the bad communication and people, let's say, don't they don't communicate very well and they don't write every detail and eventually they are not able to keep up with the new algorithmic updates or their competitors. I think that's very true of not just uh, SEO companies, but uh, affiliate companies as well. Um, you hear all these stories about companies getting to like 100 plus people. And when you have uh, disorganized management, everyone looks up and says, what are we doing? Yeah, because there's always a bigger picture and especially in the affiliate, affiliate niche as well. Uh, let's say, every, let's assume that we divide the time every five years and every five years, at least you will have one hard year. And during that hard year, and even if you are the best of best, still some of your assets, digital assets, websites or social media accounts, whatever, some of them will be having some hard times. There is no way of making like 100 person percent win rate, you will eventually get some negativity on the search and your result pages. And when it happens, the team makes, instead of they start to blame each other, they should start to look at the algorithm and they should start to think like an engineer. And this is one of the differences in my holistic SEO mindset, because uh, sometimes even if you do everything right, you will continue to lose traffic. And sometimes even if you do nothing, your traffic might be coming back in a very much better way. There are these type of possibilities. My case studies in the industry, they started as notebooks, actually. I was writing for myself and I started to publish them. And a few people have read it, they like it, and they start to implement it. Then we started to become a kind of community and very tired of community formulated, to be honest, because the number is going over 15,000 nearly. Wow. And we will even having our conference next year in Istanbul, September. So my purpose there is actually bringing them together so that I can just drink my iron at the background. <laughs> but 
basically, uh, once you lose some traffic, instead of saying that it is random, it's Google's fault, or it's designer's fault, developer's fault, content writer's fault, or it's the fault of John Miller or whatever, instead of just say, looking for a fault, just look at the algorithm and you, then you can actually understand that maybe, and most probably it is no one's fault, it's just timing. So algorithm just gathers some data, be patient and continue to give feedback. In my YouTube channel and in my some of new articles and conference speeches too, I wanted to show some direct examples with naked data, with real world SEO case studies. And I told them, look, content that we are, we are ranking higher and content that while we were not ranking, they are same, links are same. The only difference is algorithmic processes and algorithms that usually need more detail. Even this week, week, I will publish a website, Strike That Money. You can check it too. And during the one of the latest core updates, we started to rank way much higher. And it was supposed to be like that. We already knew it. And that's why no one blamed each other because we published like 200 articles. And then we knew that to be able to increase the rankings, we need a core update. Since we knew that, once we published the articles, we were getting 50 clicks a day and no one blamed each other because we already got that conscious. We already know this information. And that's why we continue to update one article every day to keep the website active. Core update happened. And in just one, seven days, we reach out to the 1,000 clicks a day. Now it's going to the 2,000 and it can even go for very much higher because right now it is ranking over 20,000 queries, for instance, just in one week. So once you understand the algorithms, you are able to communicate with the teams better. You create better, let's say, solidarity between people as well. That will lead to another question, but uh, I want to go right back to your courses on um, topical authority. Uh, can you tell us uh, what's inside and what will people learn? So topical authority has actually many different meanings according to the angle, but I believe that most of the industry, not most, but big portion of the industry at the moment, they use the term without understanding it truly. For instance, when I create the formalization of topical authority is equal to the topical coverage and multiplied with the historical data, that formula actually belongs to me, but some people start to use it like without understanding, for instance, Yes, we are covering a topic, but how we cover it in a different page, we are covering it or in a paragraph, we are covering it as a list or as a table, we are covering it. What will, what should the format should be and how many times we should be defining the same fact across different web pages, for instance. So there are different type of nuances there, but my course for topical authority, it is, I can tell that it is the most simplified version of a complete topical map and semantic content network creation. Basically, we just have chosen five components to create a proper topical map, like source context, which means, yes, you are trying to rank for a topic, but why? Because sometimes, especially display ads companies, they try to just rank for a query, just so that you can get the impressions and the money as the ads, but you don't sell something, you are not expert at the, on the subject, and if the user wants to do another another, let's say, activity, they are not able to perform it on your website. They need to make another search or they need to return back to the search engine result page, which means that you should be having actually a connection with the topic that you are trying to rank for as a company, not as a website. So source context is about that. When it comes to the core section of topical map, this is for a monetization, which means that we create a section that all the internal links and all the page rank all the ranking signals and authority flow directly. This is the monetization section, which is connected to your source context, which means who you are, what you do for making money. The author section of topical map, it is not for monetization. It is for gaining the trust of the search engine even further. And in my course, I give an example pilot project that I did two years ago. I started two projects at the same day and I ended them at the same day after increasing the traffic. Then I demonstrate just only one of them, their topical map and the formula behind it. Outdoor section is mostly about processing at specific entities, all the attributes. For instance, if it is Germany, we go for culture. But if we process the culture, we don't go really deep. We just take the coverage and connect it to the cultural visa because we are a visa company, for instance. If we go for German literature, we connect it to the German language and language goes to the language school and language visa. So every connection that we create eventually goes back to the course section for monetization. 
an outdoor section ranks higher and it tells the search engine that, look, if you want to satisfy all the queries and needs behind these queries about Germany or France, whatever, just choose a single website. We cover all the attributes anyway in the best format and you don't even need to look at the second website as well. Another concept that we use central entity, which means that one entity will be appearing in across all the topical map to state that this specific segment is about one thing only. There is one more concept that we use, central search intent, which will be reflected site-wide. So this is actually something that search engine says in the helpful content update announcement too. They say that don't chase the traffic, do not try to rank for just ranking, and you should justify why you are ranking there. Another thing is, if you are not able to reflect one main thing and one main search intent across your website, it means that you are processing multiple topics, industries, subjects. And these type of websites are very hard to rank if they don't have enough level of page rank and brand value. Because if you have, let's say, nine irrelevant topics in your website, in this case, you will be clustered with nine different really good authorities from nine different topics, and you will be competing against all of them. And most of the time, out of these nine topics, at least for seven of them, you will be losing really good amount of traffic and it will be putting your website into a negative ranking state. Even for two topics, you are really good. Still, it won't be working to actually rank higher there. For Google Discover too, we see the same situation. If you have Google Discover traffic, for instance, instead of trying to go for five, six, seven different topics to the Google Discover, we usually tell that choose one topic and process it deeper, process it more, process it more frequently. Then you will be able to get more discovered traffic. Sometimes a news website, even if they have 24 different news genre, usually search engine chooses news website for one or two topics. It might be finance, it might be magazine, and usually they are opposite. For instance, if you are ranking for magazine in Google Discover, you don't rank for business that much. It directly shows actually how they are choosing your identity in that area too. So the course basically helps people to create better topical maps by understanding search engines. And it also helps them for communicating with their writers, creating really good detailed, let's say, content briefs, internal link designs, and ranking without needing to the external factors like page rank at the same time. Makes a lot of sense. I'm reading a lot more about Python and SEO and wanted to know how you're working with Python uh, for SEO. So, uh, it's a nice question. I was, to be honest, I learned actually web development and coding because of bad web developers, because I found myself that I had to do their tasks by myself. But uh, I must tell that actually lately, still I am using Python actually for some of the tasks. For instance, the one thing that I do frequently is scraping all the sitemaps of my competitors, then checking actually their content. I scrape, it, let's say, five steps, scrape competitor topical map, then take URLs, then crawl these URLs, then implement a named entity recognition algorithm to get all the entities or the most important entities in these specific URLs, let's say, and just check three or four of their anchor tags in these URLs. It will be giving you an idea of what they are processing, what they are connecting to what. And based on that, I'm able to actually, let's say, reverse engineer a with their structure in a better format. This is one of the ways of using Python. Lately, I am not using it that much because it started to become reflexive for me. Because some people, they feel that using Python is cool. Yeah, it's cool. But if you're able to do it directly, just do it directly. Do not try to just uh, do it always with, the, with coding. But Python is a really great way of gathering data. Uh, for instance, you can always, let's say, let's say you want to get your indexation delay. Let's assume that you get the date in your sitemap. Then you get the first hit from Googlebot and you implement a kind of subtract and you get your, let's say, indexation delay for new published content. If you are decreasing indexation delay, it means that you are increasing your topical authority, for instance. Most of the time, it will be actually correlating with your rankings too. It will be one of the things that you can continuously track with. Another thing that you can do is you can write a script. That script can go to the competitor page, download their HTML every day, and you can use diffLib in Python to see what they are adding, what they are removing in every 30 days. Then you can compare it to the day rankings, for instance. All these things might be helpful for you to see that it's not happening randomly. 
So Python is definitely helpful there. But after doing this for eight years, I just do it reflexive way, to be honest. And I actually, if you are coming to that level, it's the best because you don't spend your time for gathering the data. It's not that easy. For instance, before, like three years ago, I was even checking search engine result pages every 12 seconds. And then I was animating this because I see that some certain results change their rankings with some certain other results. And it was helping to me actually to see after what update, which source goes where and which one goes back. Then I was taking their, let's say, unique size and I was creating a better form to be tested there too. Once I see that search engine now test me, then it means that actually I am doing something positive there. So you can always use this, but if you are an agency, it's very hard to use this. If you have a single project, just one, if you are an affiliate with 10 websites, again, you can't do this that much, to be honest. Uh, but if you have like one main mothership, then yes, you can and you should do these things in a better way. Uh, it's, I think the topic that everyone talks about, like almost once a year, that SEO is dying. And lately with uh, tools like ChatGPT, and what Google's doing, people are worried that, you know, Google's just going to take data from your site, feed it as part of a search result and not send the traffic over. Um, just want to get your take on that. And going back to the question is, is SEO dying? So first of all, no. Second of all, uh, to kill the SEO, you need to actually kill liberal market. It's about actual market and economy model that we are in. As long as there are two companies which compete with each other, and as long as people need to search and compare, there will be a search engine and search engine optimization. So SEO is just changing, but it won't be dying. Another thing is, if you look at the things from the economical point of view, from Google side, let's say Google takes all the content and they start to give their own answer to the users. But what is the gaining of Google from there, here actually? Because they won't be able to show any ads on the websites for display ads. They won't be able to show also PPC ads on the search because SGE, search generative experience results, by the way, very bad name to be honest. Uh, let's say just generative results. Let's say they appear at the top, then Google gives the ads here, which means that ads won't be getting that much click as well. And it will be decreasing the amount of money that advertisers give to the Google. And if these websites here, organic websites here, if they don't get the clicks, display ads won't be getting clicks, impressions. And again, people will stop paying Google again. So Google wouldn't kill themselves. What they will need to be doing is creating maybe a new type of, let's say, a new type of monetization. And another concept that actually I created is cost of retrieval. Google calculates cost of every search, cost of every curl hit, cost of every day that they are ranking you. They rank you for making money. They don't rank you because you are really an ex expert on the subject. They just make money on you. So basically, in this case too, search generative experience results, they are way much more expensive than actually a regular result. So why shall I serve all the time expensive result despite it harms my own economy? If Google would be having a money while killing SEO, they will kill it tomorrow. They wouldn't care about it. And they don't like SEO or SEOs at all. We all know that, to be honest. At least I know it. So they will kill it if they could. But killing SEO will be harming them back, actually, because it's not. it doesn't make sense from business point of view. So from macroeconomics point of view, SEO is safe. And from, let's say, market philosophy point of view, SEO is safe again, because even if the results are just coming from search generative experience, there is a point that it will be ordinary and people will need to click some of these SGE results eventually. And usually in the generative results, we actually have very much more clickable points, which help you to actually go more granular and help you to actually rank even your new websites for really long form questions. Because every year on Google, average query length becomes longer. 10 years ago, even three word queries were long tail. Now, actually, long tail start from five words nearly. So every year, long tail keywords, they are getting even more long tail because people start to even talk to the search bar. They even don't type anymore. So basically, whenever they search more, let's say fantasy type of things, very much longer things with your new websites, you will always have an opportunity to rank in the generative results too. And also you can generate very much more content now. 
So I believe it is an advantage, but I must tell that uh, mindset of last 10 to 20 years have to change because it's not just like link and rank anymore. You need to really realize that search engine, they started to recognize the real world entities. They directly get all the data on this planet about person type of entities, location type of entities, businesses, stock prices, or weather, or news, or even sport matches, concerts. They literally sense entire planet. It means that actually it's not just link and rank because if search engine sees that one factor is easily manipulated and if they are able to be controlled with this signal, they will create a second one. And if that second one is harder to optimize or understand, they will stick with that. Right now, it is the reason that actually I also focus on semantics and natural language processing, understanding and generation more and more. And I believe SEO won't be that uh, at all. As long as there is a liberal market, it will continue to live. Liberal market, multiple competitors and let's say ability and freedom to choose your own companies. It will keep search engines searching safe. And lastly, as long as, as long as we are able to just, let's say, as long as there is a kind of search activity, you can always communicate and contact with your customers in different ways too. It doesn't always have to be Google, by the way. Let's say ChatGPT gives all the large language model results or generative results. You can rank there too. Not that just focus on a single search engine. And I believe in the future, we will be seeing a different mindset in the SEOs too. Makes sense. Going back to topical authority and thinking about, you know, content marketing as being more than just words, how would you say or advise affiliates to look at doing other things, whether it's like video, audio, or something else that's just like beyond written content for integrating into their websites? So since 2019, I didn't write it in my case studies, but since 2019, I always observed that a company with active YouTube channel is able to protect itself in a very much better way than the core updates and also spam updates because social media accounts and especially accounts or platforms like YouTube, they directly prove that there is a real person and real business and organization that communicate with the people and they are accountable. Second thing is that the YouTube and the Google, they are all under the alphabet and they share the data between each other. And sometimes on YouTube search, we see actually Google feature snippets. They are, they are like bridge search engines to each other. It's not coincidence that Vimeo doesn't rank in the video results. It's not because Vimeo is a bad website because it's not YouTube. That's why we always, in the news SEO too, we see that if a news website hosts videos in their website, they don't get video clicks that much. But if you host them on YouTube, you get your video clicks directly. So if you look for some extra efforts that you can do, you can consider SEO part of your media business. Because even if you are testing, ranking, reviewing, I don't know, just zigzag guns or just these type of things, you can always actually show yourself with your face with these specific type of products with real world experience. It will be very much better. And the good side is you don't need to show your face because YouTube automation is also getting really, really popular. You can go to the Fiverr, you can pay someone just, I don't know, $50 or $100, and they can try the product for you directly. And then you can use AI for editing it and add it to the web website. There was one thing that we did, for instance, before uh, for one of, actually it was in my first topical author, the case study, people in Turkey, they always search for what does X mean in English because they try to learn English. And we have taken dictionary, Oxford dictionary, and we have put it to do a kind of, let's say, Excel sheet. And this is a, this happened like 2018, by the way. Imagine that you have like 500 rows in the Excel sheet. It is always for a single word and its meaning in English. Then we have the word, we have a title for the video, we have description in the video, and we also have the, let's say the verse that will be appearing in the video. They are all in different rows. The next step for us was using After Effect because there was a mode there to use After Effect with the Excel. Then we have chosen a background and After Effect have taken half million rows with all these titles, descriptions, or timestamps or whatever. They created all these videos. The next step is just uploading all them to the YouTube. And we uploaded half million videos and all the videos are just last 20 seconds, by the way, to the YouTube channel. And we were getting actually 1 million view amount. 
most of them were coming from Google. They didn't rank in on YouTube. I didn't care about YouTube rankings, to be honest, because no one on YouTube searched for what does X mean. They searched for units like learn English or this type of things, or English, English lecture they search, but they don't search for dictionary words. But in Google, they search for dictionary meaning, and I always have all the video carousels there, because since I have half a million videos, you, Google had to trigger video carousels there. And then we used actually all these videos to get the traffic there. And how about today, let's say you have 1,000 product, 1,000 reviews. Why don't you actually create, by using your GBT model, create a similar Excel sheet, go to a specific type of, let's say, video generator, and create your scripts, automate your video creation, and create start creating actually multiple YouTube, let's say, team channels by using these type of methods. But still, I will suggest you to try to use a human being as much as possible, because directly Google states that human effort, human involvement is a really important signal for trustworthiness, because you can't sue, you can't bring an AI to court. Let's say you suggest a product, I use the product, then let's say I get sick. I will be suing actually you, Google, or the product owner, or all of you. And if you just go and Google, make a search in title or all in title, colon, Google sue, Google court. Every day check these results. A day, maybe Google gets like 500 court problems. That's why they have a really huge legal team. So it's one of the reasons that they try to actually focus on this real world expertise section. Try to show yourself there and you can always use YouTube, I suggest, TikTok definitely I suggest. Especially if you are in the fitness industry, protein powder industry, or these type of things, definitely use TikTok a lot. And for instance, uh, for one project that I helped, and still I want to help to do the project, but I don't have enough time, Athletic Insights. That's come. We even used my own gym teacher there for creating unique videos, for instance, and unique pictures. Then we automated TikTok and most of the social media accounts because it also helps you to connect all these entities or platforms to back you and search engine actually gets these trust signals there in a faster way as well. One more thing, Microsoft Bing is more open to give this type of information and you can directly check Bing guidelines, for instance, they directly state that trust signals from social media platforms, they are used in their algorithm. Yandex already is leaked, they are also using it. And I believe SEOs, generation by generation, will lose our memory because since I read the last 20 years, I know that around between 2011 and 2013, Facebook agencies, they actually stopped selling Facebook ads. They were also selling Facebook comments, Facebook likes, just for Google results. It was a thing in this SEO field as well. So always be appearing in the social media platforms as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. Social has a, a lot of impact. I've uh, I've done a lot of interviews with different SEOs from varying varying backgrounds and expertise, and I've seen a lot of them that they also do their own affiliate sites. Um, maybe affiliates don't need to do their own SEO agencies, but what would you say the advantages of spending time, you know, being a consultant? Uh, what that's going to help for uh, being a, an affiliate? The advantage of the consultancy is that you always face with a new problem that appear in a new industry, new topic or new vertical. For instance, maybe it's a little bit awkward example, but let's say one of my old friends came to me and he opened an AI website, but to be honest, AI website was adult. They were just generating some bad pictures, basically. And you start to see that industry. Then another person comes to you and tell that, for instance, I want to create a Bible website. And you also help for that too, because there was a Bible website that gets 26 million clicks a month. And the good side is Bible doesn't get updated. You don't need to update the content. It's always the same for the last 15th century or 2000 centuries. So basically, you only thing that you can do is keeping there as much as possible. Let's, let's say I go to the sports betting in this case, and I check actually that they, they need lots of sport results articles. But what's the best way for that? Publishing more frequent articles and or how, will, how you will get the attention of the search engine for that specific topic or the subject. And from there, then I go to the, let's say, protein powder industry. If you want to consider yourself like a holistic SEO, if you really love the search engine optimization, doing something for SEO, even if it is sometimes free, still you actually you feel like you are doing what you should be doing. 
And the advantage there is richness of angle and richness of the problems. Whenever you see a new problem, you just get a new angle, new experience. And that's the reason that actually I have read so many patents, research papers, and that's the reason that I am working in many industries. It always helps me to actually keep me sharp as right. much as possible. I, I agree. I, it's uh, you know I don't do a lot of SEO consulting. I haven't done it in a long time. But whenever I try to help people, uh, my first thing I do is I look at a different industry, or maybe they're trying to rank for like a gym in a certain town. I go to another town and I, I try to find what can I learn from you know bigger cities or something yeah. different where I can I can copy the knowledge. Definitely. And for instance, when it comes to low industry, the external reviews, external mentions, they become more important, for example. And when it comes to, the, let's say, stock market, uh, in this case, even if you give the best information, if the information there, for instance, if it is not represented with good amount of graphics, you won't be able to actually rank that much or you won't be sticky in the search and result pages that much. Once you see that, you are able to gather the patterns in a, in a better way. Another advantage is the networking. Right now, from Israel to the Costa Rica to the Japan, or of course USA or Argentina, I know many people from all the nations, all the countries, just thanks to this type of a network. And it was the reason that I was able to create a community. If you want to create a mindset, a community around the SEO, consultancy is the best way, to be honest. Because if you go for affiliate, usually you will be going for one or two industry. Then you can create maybe a community just for that industry. But if you want to create an SEO community from around the globe, you need to be existing in all these languages, regions, and industries. I agree. You shared a couple of data stories about really interesting things and projects you're working on. And I'm just wondering uh, if you have any more data stories to share where maybe you had a hypothesis and the, the study or the case study or the results uh, gave you an insight that you weren't expecting. In the past, it happened a few times, to be honest, uh, because sometimes, for instance, in, in some of my projects, I usually tell the client that, look, after one or this specific core update, for instance, this March, again, I am expecting core update because I have a kind of table. So we have two core updates in 13th March, March for instance, one in the 21st March and one at the end of the March. Usually the March has a core update, for instance, and I expect one there. Then I tell the client that, look, they didn't focus on this industry before that much. They didn't focus on this language that much. And probably they will be updating a few things there and reflecting this. And then I tell them that, look, the, the companies, or let's say 30% of the websites that increase their rankings after this core update, after this specific unofficial update, they started to decrease their rankings, which means that they actually try to balance their configuration a little bit. And in this specific core update, it might be helpful for us because we were in this cluster, for example. When I analyze these things, I always try to get a kind of guess because when we create a topical map and content network, and when we adjust our links as well, or technical issue, we always have a date in our mind let's say March, let's say September or whatever, there will be an update and we will be seeing a ranking. And sometimes, for instance, for let's say the video that I was publishing this week too, uh, core updates became in a weird way. Every month we had a core update. And in my opinion, they were partial core updates. Like this was a partial system update and another one was completing it in the next batch, let's say. At least it's my opinion because it's unique that seeing that. And it was a little bit surprising for me because for the two core updates and one helpful content update, we didn't see the ranking. In the fourth one, we have seen the ranking. It means that in the fourth one, they focused on something else that they didn't focus on before. And it might be the new websites. It might be new websites for a region or for a topic. Or maybe it's not a topic, but maybe just a timing as well. Maybe they didn't get enough. Maybe you need to exceed a certain type of impression threshold there. So it was a little interesting for me. Another thing is that sometimes once these websites see the rankings, it even surprises me because they they get really huge amount of traffic, but it is not a good thing actually. For instance, two years ago, a website that we created after a ranking, we reached out to the 600,000 clicks a month and it came from actually 50,000 clicks. If you create such a jump, it's good, but there's also something we call sinister surge, which means you increase your traffic like that it stays there for three weeks or one month, then it, you decrease it in a really very bad way. That's why usually I prefer, let's say, a gradual increase through the time by proving yourself to the every update to update. It's way more, much more trustworthy, to be honest. 
Another thing is that we use AI a lot. I, I have shown it in my speeches, in conferences, even in 2021. In one project, we reach up to the 61,000 clicks a day by using artificial intelligence. It was one of the earliest, uh, earliest examples. Then we got a manual penalty. It was shocking for me because they were saying that we were actually using content schemes. But they are they were not clear because AI wasn't in the Google's own guidelines since then. And they didn't say AI, etc. They just said content scheme. And then we actually didn't remove the AI content. We just changed the content on the homepage, removed a few sections. Then from zero click to do 8,000 clicks a day, we were able to come very quickly. But then even if we try to increase it further, sometimes it increases, but sometimes it comes back. And it's created a little bit, let's say, suspect on me. Like they always keep the website a little bit filtered because even if you don't fix your website, Google's own manual penalty team is not SEO. They are not expert on the search engine optimization that much. They have just a guideline, instructions. They check you, they keep the penalty or they remove it. A few times I have seen many wrong decisions that they have taken. They shouldn't have removed the manual penalty, but they removed that. But they shouldn't have because links were there. So my point is that I believe they have a filter after the manual penalties. They keep you a little bit ordered there. We couldn't increase or go further than the 8,000, for instance. In our early AI launches in 2021, let's say, we use the same method, similar expired domains. Some of them rank really high, some of them don't. My only guess there is that the ones that don't rank that much high in the log files, they have lots of URLs in the memory of the Google bot because Google bots continue to focus on the 404 URLs, removed URLs, redirections from seven years ago. It was one of the differences that I can see there, but still I would expect better than that. So these type of experiences, but the reason that it is shocking is that there is not that much data because it's, you have just a few samples and you have to play with your guess game by reading patterns, research papers, log files, and you need to create a, a, the most logical way but even the best logical way is guesswork. So that's why it's a little bit the hard part and shocking part is coming from there because we are shocked because we don't know it. One more, for instance, I tell it in my uh, conferences sometimes too. I was doing DDoS attack when I was a PBM manager to the other PBMs. Whenever I do the DDoS attack, the guys were increasing their rankings. And then I started to think that they are increasing their rankings because I sent them DDoS. Doesn't make sense. Then I attack myself and I increased my own rankings. Then I continue to do videos on me. Then I was able to understand the reason for one year later because Google was thinking that whenever I sent the bots or requests, Google thinks that it is real traffic and there is a trend or reason behind that. And whenever they see, see the popularity, they increase the rankings. It was the reason for that, but it was shocking for me because why shall videos attack increase the rankings? It doesn't make sense. But it's, you need to read and guess in a better way. And always be testing. Um, yeah. Speaking of testing and tools, uh, what, what SEO tools are ones that you, you use? I use not because they are the best, by the way. I am because sometimes I use a tool name and people go and buy it, and I'm not affiliated with all, any of them. I will just say these names because they're a bit habit for me. I use HRS because their its interface is faster, not because it's fast, just I like that fast interface. And I trained some of my teammates based on HDFs. If I change the tool, then I need to retrain them again, and it keeps me there as well. Mm. I also use SEMrush, and I'm mostly in the SEMrush. I, li I like actually their local tracking feature, and I like their also content tracking and content change plan section, auto reporting section is really good, and their Vin diagram is a really good feature there, because in Vin diagrams, I'm able to see which website is stronger for what subject and what are the missing parts between them. It's a really good feature. And I also use sometimes infra notice, a lesser known tool, but I demonstrated in, in my course as well, because it helps you to actually see how search engine create an information graph across all the search engine result pages and URLs that rank on there. And you can see which word is connected to which word in what way it's helpful. And Maybe as a suggestion, I don't use it directly as a suggestion, Jet Octopus will be one of the really good technical SEO crawlers. And you can also try to check, uh, let's say there are some AI 
based backlink uh, outreachers for by using Haro. Basically in Haro, rather than checking every possibility or every journalist one by one, imagine that AI does your filtration for you. Write your outreach mail based on the URLs that you already have in your website. Let's say you want to link one URL from you and they directly find a similar Haro outreach for you and they merge it for you directly. So it might help you to actually make time in a really good way as well. But besides these, I handle things mostly with, uh, let's say, Python. And I use Screaming Frog as well, Sidebulb, again, I am using uh, from time to time. So there, I have many tools, but I don't have time to use them all the time. So that's why I usually go to Search Console, check update dates, reactions, create my hip hypothesis, and I go for implementing a strategy for that. Then tools come way much later, I must tell. But these tools, they are usually in my tool set. And what do you see as the future of affiliate marketing as it intersects with business intelligence? To be honest, I believe most affiliates today, they will be having their own direct businesses. Rather than being an affiliate, I believe that they will be having direct seller of these things. Because if you're already ranking there, and right now you have AI, you can design with AI, you can do or code with AI. So your entry cost for e-commerce is decreased in a really good way with a kinds of certain, let's say, invoice generator or other type of features, you can create your e-commerce website in a separate website as well. And you can continue to rank with your affiliate and you can also send directly your request to yourself and you can do drop shipping. I even now see lots of affiliates go for e-commerce rather than bargaining on the, let's say, profit margin and commissions, they directly sell their own products. And I support that because I believe SEOs should be business people, not website owners. You can't be happy just as a website owner. Eventually, these assets will be in the risk. As I say, even if you have the best team, every five years, one year will be passing bad. So it's not your fault. As I say, it's a little probabilistic. And eventually, you'll be having some hard time. But if you own your own business directly, if you are an affiliate for yourself, I mean, it's the best way of being the affiliate, I believe. And another thing is that many people in the affiliate industry, they create random websites for random niches without not knowing nothing about that niche. And I believe Google is fighting against this in a really strong way. That's why most of the historical websites from the past, they had really good amount of filtration. And if you want to continue with the same methods, I would suggest you to use these methods in a new website because sometimes new websites have a better chance to rank because they don't have a luggage from the past. And search engines, they tend to give chances to new websites as well. So I believe affiliates, in short, they will be going for their own assets and they will need to be really an expert on the subject with their social media accounts, real world existence as much as possible. And it might be making things harder. That's why I believe Tom's guide, for instance, when we look at that specific asset, uh, it's not just like, not like asset actually, it's, oh, sorry, affiliate, it's, they, they are beyond that. It's Tom's guide now. It's already a brand. It's a real world examiner for all these products and reviewing them as well. So if you're able to be something like that in your niche with social media and maybe some partners, it will be very much easier for you to exist, continue to exist on the SERP in the coming years. And I guess uh, just to follow up to that would be to pay attention to which affiliates start doing this. Yes, definitely. For instance, just other day, so yesterday, I was examining an affiliate website, for example, and I know that the website is automated, but in a very different way, because usually when we do automation, we publish like 2000 articles a day and it works until you are hit. But it's, it's not the point of not being hit there. You can always create another website when you are hit with automation. It doesn't matter. So it was our angle at least. It is hit, good. We create 10 another website now and Google always is losing there anyway. So I, I did a speech like this in Estonia uh, this year actually and was explaining that. So this one, it was an automation, but it was using personal experience and personal perspective so heavily. A fake writer was outranking 10 years of authority websites and the domain doesn't have even proper links. I don't believe and use DR metric that much, but I will give it charts for giving an idea. DR was four, and it was actually getting over 300,000 clicks a month, and domain is under one years old, 
it has only 167 pages. They are all automated, but it is so well automated. Like it's certain that they are using AI and they are using only the pictures from Amazon to show like personal images there. But it always uses personal experience, like how I tested and ranked best safe saves for this gun, how I tested and rank these, 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 these. It's always that have, have that template and always like pros, cons, a listicle, images and direct customer reviews from Amazon together with their own reviews. They created a template like that and they rank really well to, there as well. So it means that actually that personal experience thing together with perspective, together with also forums, it's the reason that Reddit and Quora is ranking way much higher because we know that people in Reddit are people. <laughs> They are not AI. And it also gives like personal opinion. Plus there is one more major advantage there. When you rank a Reddit page, you are ranking 80 different perspectives, 80 different answers. Your affiliate page has just one answer. So actually you are trying to outrank with one answer to the other 80 writers and 80 answers. And it creates a little bit logistic problem for you. And this affiliate source was taking these reviews and thoughts to their web page and reflecting them together with their own perspective as well. And it was one of the advantages that they were, uh, let's say, balancing. And I believe in the future, we will see more examples like that. I suggest people to focus on this experience word in quality rated guidelines a lot uh, because it is directly reflected on these latest updates. Try to give facts together with your own experience or customers experience a little bit as much as possible. Uh, Cried, uh, thank you for doing this. How can people get a hold of you? They can find me actually on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We also have a community directly on Facebook, Holistic SEO. If they search for it, they can find it as well. And they can also visit us in September in Istanbul for our conference as well, if they want to. Um, I, I would be very interested in doing that. Been to Istanbul before, love it there. And to do that in uh, uh, to chat SEO would be amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. And I promise you the best cab up when you come. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you so much.